Okay, uh, great. Uh, we're going to start with the 2 o'clock uh, session, and the CLE session code is D1029. D1029. I'll give you a few seconds to copy that down, uh, and we'll have this slide at the end of the session as well um, for people who are walking in uh, late. Okay, now we're moving on, as I uh, indicated before the break, to the section that is devoted to the PTAB, and it is nice segue from Judge Alsop's talk, uh, who talked uh, about the PTAB and how um, it has changed his view of stays uh, pending IPR. Uh, and to lead the first session, which is about staying on top of recent developments at the PTAB, we have Joshua Goldberg who is a partner at Finnegan, and he is also on uh, one of the committees for the PTAB Bar Association, and uh, he's been, he and his, some of his colleagues have been instrumental in helping to uh, formulate these panels. So we thank Josh for his uh, input. Thank you, Ed, and also Greg and the others at the school for being so helpful in putting this program together. I think it's been great so far, and hopefully we can keep that up throughout the afternoon. For this panel, you know, we already heard about several uh, big changes this morning that happened to the proceedings by virtue of the Supreme Court last year. But there were a lot of other changes too. Federal Circuit cases, Aqua Products, Wi-Fi One, Click to Call, uh, new presidential PTAB decisions like General Plastic, new guidance from the PTAB based on some of these decisions, new proposed rules, a revised practice guide more, and wanted to kind of just go through in this panel what some of those changes are, what the impact is, uh, and what what uh, what should be done, what shouldn't be done going forward. And with me, we have some great folks: uh, Judge Sandin from the PTAP, Bill Beckman from Caterpillar, Professor Sapna Kumar from the University of Houston Law Center, Gary Matz from Nova Chemicals, Tim McNulty from Finnegan and Professor uh, Sarah vishnu Pukat, sorry, uh, from Texas A&M University School of Law. I want to start out by just giving them each you know, two or three minutes to just let us know a little bit about their background, their experience, uh, what their general overall viewpoint is on these issues, and then we'll go into some questions. So if we can, do you want to start us off, Judge Sandin? Okay. Um, I am a lead uh, APJ at the uh, PTAB. Um, I focus on the AI trials, mostly in the mechanical and software arts. Um, all of these things that have been going on, I've been living and breathing them for uh, very closely for the last year. Um, and some of them dramatically affect our practice. Some of them are more rules-based changes, which are easy to uh, implement, and some of them change our procedure pretty dramatically. So I look forward to this uh, conversation and hearing how it affects uh, outside as well. So I'm an intellectual property attorney for Caterpillar. I support the rail division, and I'm located just outside here in Chicago. Um, I've had a number of different roles through Caterpillar, and I've worked through a lot of different uh, clients and businesses and such, and so I hope to be able to provide you somewhat of your client's perspective or your ultimate client's perspective, um, or at least from a multinational company perspective, um, where you know, individual engineers or businessmen may be located. Um, in terms of the perspective I want to provide, we you do use um, PTAB proceedings at CAT and in terms of my practice, I just want to maybe provide some of the framework that I view these through and um, maybe the, as the cases were presented today, I want to maybe talk to you how that has changed. Um, just very briefly in terms of like the framework, I look at when I consider whether or not we're going to file an IPR, you know, there's always the risk you're going to raise your hand and draw attention to yourself and to a particular patent, so that's always there. There's the cost, and then there's an estoppel effect, and those three things are pretty much the framework that I apply, and then as that person talks, I'll use that filter to figure it out. Hi, I'm Sapna Kumar. I'm a law professor at University of Houston Law Center. I'm also co-director of the Institute for Intellectual Property and Information Law. 
My background is more in studying the interplay between the relationship of the federal circuit and the PTO. So I'm really interested in institutional design and kind of the power dynamics between the court and the agency. So my PTAB perspective comes from that lens. I'm Gary Metz. I'm uh, Chief Intellectual Property Counsel at Nova Chemicals. Nova Chemicals is primarily a plastics manufacturer. We have facilities uh, in uh, Alberta and Western Ontario and Canada, near Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, where I'm located, uh, and also on the Gulf Coast. And uh, I think uh, uh, Bill uh, gave a lot of the same perspective uh, uh, that we have as in-house looking at uh, all of the pros and cons to bring something before the PTAB. Uh, it's not just the pure legal aspects. It's also how uh, senior management views things. There, there may be conversations they're having I'm not aware of, and we have to uh, uh, you know, follow what their, their lead is. And uh, I'll also uh, mention, uh, I really appreciated uh, Judge Alsap's uh, perspective uh, having lived the very scenarios that uh, that he described, which uh, it, uh, gives me good reason to believe that the the, the PTAB approach is, is a good one because there you have a, uh, and I'm assuming that most of you are uh, former practitioners and, and patent attorneys and uh, uh, have a different view of the examiner core, similar to Judge Alsap's, uh, than say the the typical person that may sit on a jury. Yep. Uh, Tim McAnulty, um, I am a practicing attorney, um, focusing almost exclusively um, on PTAB type um, trials. Uh, have been since they came uh, to be, uh, representing both. Uh, petitioners and patent owners, um, so sort of a good perspective on um, how they work, um, how they um, are used by both petitioners and um, patent owners and, and that the, the overall regime. Um, intellectually, I, I think it's a very interesting uh, panel to have and to talk about how um, the PTAB came about wasn't that controversial uh, when it was proposed. Um, but since then, I think it's become uh, something that's been debated. And um, it's still, I think, relatively early, uh, new, and we're still working through both from the court's perspective, from practitioner's perspective, and the, the PTAB's perspective on how to get it to um, be something that works um, as intended um, and where those changes are coming, um, both from courts, from the patent office, um, and how practitioners are using those um, for both petitioners and patent owners. All right, so uh, Sarva Vishnabhakt, I'm a professor at Texas A&M. Um, my background is uh, primarily uh, academic, uh, even from before when I joined uh, the academy sort of formally. So my first job out of law school was at the patent office in the then newly created office of uh, the chief economist. So Dave Kapos, early in his administration, uh, created a uh, essentially a research division, a think tank within the agency that would uh, sort of study uh, very systematically uh, all of the data that the agency generated and then make that data publicly available as well. So since uh, 2015, when I left the office to uh, to enter academia full time, most of my research has been uh, has continued to be empirical, and it's focused primarily on the patent trial and appeal board, um, because uh, as a as a faculty fellow, uh, I worked for Artie Rye, who was uh, my co-panelist this morning, and uh, and from her I sort of learned the, the ins and outs of administrative practice in, uh, in the patent office in particular. So I've got some data I'm happy to share with you today, and uh, it's you know. Uh, sort of what the, the changes, particularly in SAS Institute, but other, other changes inside the agency uh, are also undergoing, and what effect that might have for incentives going forward. So thanks, everyone. I, I want to start out by just, given the different perspectives we have here, how do you keep track of all these changes, and how, you know, how do you stay on top of them? There were so many this year. Uh, what's your normal practice? And maybe we can start with you, Judge Sand, and give us the, from the board judge perspective. Right, so um, there's th 
300 and, or no, 270 odd judges on the board, um, maybe 100, 150 working on AI trials um, at different levels of percent work. So there's a lot of coordination that we have to do. Um, one of the things we do is every day we get an email from the day prior's decisions from the board highlighting some, some of the different cases that have gone out. Uh, we also have a weekly meeting going over whatever the latest Federal Circuit case is or maybe uh, a refresher training on certain case law. Um, so we have fairly regular, um, uh, I mean, it, it, it is changing on a daily basis. We have at least daily an update of what's going on. So I'm probably all the way at the other end with uh, Gary here. So again, when you look at your hierarchy or your focus, um, you know, the, I think the academia and your judges, Judge Sandin are all the way on the ground, and the practitioners are on the ground, and in the corporate world, we're you know 50,000 feet in the air, and it doesn't. So my day-to-day -day practice isn't impacted dramatically by typically any one particular decision, um, but I do get uh, like subscriptions with you know, like I think IP Law 360, where you get a quick, quick synopsis of everything, and I go through that, and I also really rely on just academia and uh, different patent logs to warn me of anything that's major. And anytime, anytime there is, luckily. Our uh, private practice uh, colleagues in academia you know, keep us up to date. Hmm. Yeah, as an academic, my perspective's a little bit different. I'm IP, IP Law 360, patently obvious, is a huge help to me. And we have listservs, which can be very helpful for figuring out what's significant. Yeah, I think, uh, like everybody else mentioned, uh, we rely on some of the various newsletters, try to track uh, some of the key cases that are going through the federal circuit. Um, I think the newsletters are better at, at getting us uh, information that may be coming out of the PTAB. And uh, we also rely on uh, uh, external counsel, so private practice uh, counsel, uh, to help uh, make sure that uh, we're aware of and, and putting to practice what are best practices. As those change, uh, based on uh, the changing nature of, of patent law, um, I, I think, you know, the, the decisions that come out and obviously the volume that comes from the PTAB itself is significant and, you know, there's the general, you know, following of that. Um, there's fewer Fed Circuit decisions, but obviously you follow those and you know sort of how that case law is going um, from, you know, the private practice side. Um, and you follow them and you know how they're impacting the particular cases that you're handling. Um, just like, you know, any other area of the law that you're following. Um, and then you see how they, they play out. You understand the issues on both sides. And um, when those decisions come, um, you decide whether they impact and you communicate to uh, the clients, et cetera, and see how that plays, um, not just on the ground day-to-day -day, um, handling the particular case that's in front of you, um, but long-term strategy that you're working through on, you know, the cases at each of the different levels. So uh, I, I certainly agree with uh, with Sapna that uh, you know, Pat and Leo and the uh, the IP professors listers are, are a, a good source of information for me and a regular source. I also keep track of a few other blogs, IP Watchdog, and so on. Uh, one I think overlooked source uh, is subscribing to the uh, to the distribution list of the Patent Office itself. So the PTAB. Uh, in, in particular, and the Patent Office Communications uh, Office more generally is constantly sending out information about what they want stakeholders to know. I think the Patent Office is one of the more stakeholder responsive agencies in the government and wants everybody to be on the same page as them. And so I found that to be a really good source of uh, what the office thinks is important about itself. And I will say too, you know, from, uh, from writing guests blog posts on, on Patent Leo of my own uh, helps me stay on top of the issues for two reasons. One, it actually forces me to sort of sit down and synthesize what's going on. But uh, now that I'm somebody who writes with sort of semi-frequent uh, uh, regularity, uh, people who are also part of the conversation and learn stuff that I wouldn't necessarily have access to will send that to me. Because, hey, did you read about this? I enjoyed your post. I thought you might be interested. And just the generosity of colleagues like that, uh, many of whom I haven't met uh, except over email, uh, keeps me up to date. And, and it's a great way to sort of stay invested in the, uh, this, this patent system that, uh, that we're all interested in and, and want to see do well. 
So, Saurabh, I think we've got a range of experiences in the audience today from students uh, to in-house to uh, Judge Alsop maybe still here to uh, you know, practitioners who are in the weeds every day. Mm -hmm. What are the big changes? What are the things that we really need to know about over the past year? And I guess I understand you have some presentation slides that may deal. Yeah, this. so uh, in, in keeping with the sort of cardinal rule of PowerPoint, it's all pictures, no words. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll get a sense of that. Uh, the two big cases that I was following in the Supreme Court this year, of course, were, uh, were oil states and, uh, and SAS. Oil states, while important, ended up being sort of a great big nothing burger in the way of not abolishing <coughs> the PTAB. So what I'll uh, sort of talk you through is a new paper I've got coming out. You can read the full thing on SSRN, and I've got some data here from that. Um, it builds on my remarks from this morning a little bit that SAS Institute uh, while temporarily inconvenient for the office, is actually going to lead to better outcomes uh, for the system and for the agency uh, itself. So let's begin with life in the last six and a half years of, uh, or excuse me, five and a half years of PTAB practice, because we just reached the sixth anniversary uh, about a week ago. So 35% of all inter partes review proceedings, uh, petitions, were um, fully denied through April 2018, right? This is the universe of, of all petitions in inter partes review through April 2018. About 39% uh, uh, and change were fully granted. And it's just this quarter, 25% and change in the middle, where partial institution was, was made. When, and when you say fully, instituted. Yeah. Do you mean every claim or do you mean every claim on every ground? Every claim on every ground. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, it's a, it, it's a great point and one I'll get to in just a moment. So, this would suggest the partial institution, while, you know, significant and, and not trivial, uh, was not doing a ton of work. And in fact, if you look at this figure over time, six month moving average from June 2013 through the, the end of my, my data collection period of April of 2018. The orange that partially instituted, right, it was a pretty big share at the outset. Because there was, people were just, it was a gold rush. Everybody wanted to challenge everything. And uh, the patent office was using, the PTAB was using partial institution a lot to filter its workload. And over time, Petitioners got better, they got more responsible. Patent owners got better at uh, sort of uh, foreseeing what would be a good set of responses in the initial uh, response period that they got. And the PTAB got better at uh, figuring these things out. So over time, starts to occupy a smaller and smaller share. And by the time we get to April 2018, when SAS actually uh, was, was handed down, it only occupied about 18%. Uh, which was the most recent figure at the time that, uh, that then uh, Chief Judge Rushke pointed out as well. So this would suggest that petitions that are being partially instituted, not a very big share at all. SAS Institute's not going to have uh, a very big impact on the PTAB's operations because partial institution just isn't doing very much work as a practical matter. Problem with that is if you look at the claims themselves, not the petitions, but the actual patent claims on a per claim, per statutory ground basis. Claim one is being challenged on 102, claim one is being challenged on 103, claim two is being, and so on. If you look at each of those as an adjudicatory unit, rather than the petition, some petitions may be small, some may be big, but if you look at the actual workload being imposed, then in the aggregate, about 50% of the workload that came to the agency's doorstep was actually admitted through the institution process. And the remaining 50% was kicked out. So this is the real filtering work that the doctrine of partial institution was doing. And if you look at this over time, uh, actually, well, let me show you first across technology, um, it's pretty robust. It's about 50-50 no matter what major technology area you're talking about. And over time, it started at about 70%, so 70% grant, 30% uh, filtered out. It stabilized at 50% and has been incredibly steady over that time. So this tells us that looking at the petition as the you know, sort of unit of observation is misleading and it understates how much work partial institution was doing. And as a result, it underestimates what effect the SAS Institute decision will have. This is something that I think the patent office should take close heed of. And anybody who follows uh, statistics about the PTAB uh, should also take, uh, pay close attention to. 
the blue line and the, the uh, orange line are the two forms of statistics that everybody in the blogosphere, whether it's IP Watchdog or Patent Leo or the Patent Office itself, um, has been relying on. The blue line is the share of petitions in which at least a partial grant was made. Okay, so at least partly this was granted, and that tells us something about uh, the work that the Patent Office is doing and the, the quality of the patents that are coming before them. Now, once something is instituted, the fact that there's a high rate of invalidation upon those things where institution was made, well, my answer to that is, of course. It's a reasonable likelihood of success standard. That tells us that the PTAB judges are accurately forecasting what is reasonably likely to succeed. That's not a big surprise. But if you look at the, the black line, this is, or excuse me, the, the orange line, this is where at least a partial uh, denial was made, either fully denied or partially denied on the petition. We're still looking at the petition. Those are two ways of looking at the same thing. What is the institution rate? If you're not looking at the claim ground pairs but the petitions, you're systematically going to overestimate what the patent office is doing. You're going to say they're taking in more than they actually appear to be doing, or they're kicking out more than they appear to be kicking out. It's only when you look at the black line, this claim ground pair approach to things. And it's, it's easy to understand why somebody would not want to look at it that way. It's really data intensive and sort of uh, uh, time intensive to collect all that information, but I think that's really the only way you're going to get a realistic picture of agency workload. And so uh, the reason I've sort of put this into a, a paper and, and, and gotten it published is that I really want us to think uh, in, in much more precise terms about what statistics we look at because those statistics are in fact what help us keep track of how the agency is doing, what we should do to respond to it, and, uh, and these sorts of things. So. I'll, I'll welcome any questions uh, later on if you have, you know, sort of want to dig into it. Uh, but for now, that's the, the sort of data I wanted to share with you. Well, boots on the ground, I, I would say that, that SAS, of all the things that were listed, um, does affect our day-to-day -day the most. Um, you know, that was, you know, an efficiency mechanism that is no longer. Um, so, so that means now every single thing that gets put in the petition has to be weighed. And so now we're, we're seeing uh, strategies, people putting in lots of things, people putting in few things, trying to figure out what's the optimal approach. And maybe that overall will let, lead to something efficient in the future. But right now in this figuring out phase, it is a lot, a lot more work for us to go through yeah. all of those um, and have a, a complete trial on everything. Yeah. Is your sense that the extra work on the back end dealing with all the grounds is significantly greater than now at the institution decision. It's at least theoretically possible to just deal with one. Um, yeah, so we, ha we have presumably the option of just yeah. saying one and one and done. Um, but the, uh, the direction that the, I think the director has been speaking a lot about is, is provide the information up front. Mm. Um, you, you, get, you get all your ducks in a row so that you know more about what you're going to have to say in the final. You also increase the likelihood of settlement by providing more information to the parties. That's kind of the path that um, that the director, um, you know, has, has envisioned this going. I, th I think there was a blip, as somebody mentioned before, of, of one and done cases immediately after SAS. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would be very surprised if that was a long-term trend at all. So we, we've kind of heard the impact on the office to the others on the panel, what is the impact on the parties? Is this something that favors one party or the other? Maybe it's good for both, maybe it's bad for both. Thoughts on that? So from a client perspective, or you know, just as a, again, my, my practice perspective, SAS obviously was the most impactful of everything we heard this morning. But um, when, I, when I consider IPRs on the continuum of tools that we could use, they're very close to litigation. They aren't like European patent oppositions where you could file them, you know, just as a matter of course, you could file them with a straw man and not even, you know, raise your hand. They are, um, the estoppel effect, as I mentioned, really is the thing that holds us back. And so, as Judge Sandin said, some petitioners throw, you know, everything in the kitchen sink at it. And then I think that had been one of our strategies that we would consider, not that we would always do it, but it was certainly in our back pocket. Um, and then with the thought that, sort of mitigate that estoppel effect, you know, the 
PTAB wouldn't institute all of those, so you'd still preserve some avenues of, of uh, appeal or, you know, when you actually go to court. Um, now, with it taking it all, it just shifts the, it shifts the IPR even closer to litigation and, frankly, makes us less likely to uh, institute it in any particular case. Yeah, if I can add to what Bill said, uh, for instance, with clearance opinions, uh, you know, SAS has a, has an impact because as you, uh, and typically we'll work with outside counsel on these, uh, the, uh, the possibility of, uh, in the previous uh, framework prior to SAS, where a partial institution was possible, that would sort of influence our view of, on a clearance opinion on a particular patent uh, differently than uh, after SAS, uh, when it, uh, you can uh, challenge, if you go to an IPR, you would challenge a certain number of claims, but you run the risk uh, that the whole thing could be thrown out if you don't choose your claims wisely. Uh, so that impact on, on analysis and, and we view clearance opinions as prep work as you know, we're just in case uh, we end up in an uh, in an IPR, we've got all of the legwork done ahead of time, and we know how we, how we would want to proceed. Thoughts from anyone else? Um, there, there have been a lot of decisions, and you know, SAS is, is probably the, the biggest. Um, I'm not sure, at least from my view, um, that as we go through SAS, which side, petitioner or patent owner, is it ultimately going to um, sort of benefit or not. I think right. overall, I think it um, has the, the potential to um, move the overall PTAB process um, to, I think as Bill indicated, something that is more like the alternative to litigation. Mm -hmm. um, I think in a way that can be, you know, beneficial to both sides. Um, there is a lot of criticism, um, you know, of the, the process being the, the first step, not an alternative. And so it just adds, you know, additional fights, um, additional costs, additional forums. Um, so as we still work through, and, and it depends on how all the stakeholders, the office, the courts, and um, petitioners and patent owners use the overall process as it continues to grow. So I'm not sure, you know, any one particular thing sort of always says, well, this is good for patent owner and or this is good for, for petitioner. I think Aqua Products was another really big case this year, and uh, we've also had um, some indication that there may be further guidance from the pizza changes and processes coming. Uh, you know, I know I think Tim was involved in the case, um, but can you at least just tell us what it was about without any? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and it, we'll, we'll turn to everybody else for what it actually means. Uh, so it, uh, the Aqua Products case um, was uh, about the motions to amend. Um, it uh, came from a, an early PTAB uh, IPR uh, case um, where a motion to amend was presented. Um, the ultimate issue that went all the way up was which side uh, – has that burden uh, with respect to the proposed substitute claims in a motion to amend. Um, the, there was competing views. The, the Patent Office had taken the view that the motion was a typical motion um, where that moving party seeking relief has to show and carries that burden um, to get the relief that they're requesting. In the motion to amend, that's the um, entry of the substitute claim, showing the patentability of them. Um, uh, the other competing side was the, the statutory language that the petitioner bears the burden um, to show on patentability and it doesn't make a distinction between proposed substitute claims and a motion to amend um, or the original claims. And so generally that um, was the side. There had been a few cases uh, that raised similar issues uh, before the Aqua Products case. Um, the Aqua Products case was the one that um, went from the panel, which was upholding the, the, the current practice or the practice at that time, um, then went to the en banc um, and had a uh, 
different outcome. And I'll stop there because the yeah. case is still Maybe, uh, um, We can go to Sapna for some. Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms, in terms of the day to day impact of this case on the PTAB itself, I don't think there is much of one in terms of the PTAB is still granting very few of these motions to amend. Um, but what I think is really significant about this case is it shows just how fractured the federal circuit is with regard to their views on the authority of the PTAB, powers of the PTO with regard to rulemaking, what the standard of review is for, mm -hmm. you know, for reviewing a case like this. Is it Chevron step one? Is it under Chevron step two? Is it under Skidmore hour? I mean, the fact that there were, I think it was five separate opinions and they could come up with about two sentences that they could garner, you know, that they could get a majority on just shows how, you know, how deeply troubling it is that we're relying on them to, you know, to kind of straighten all of this out. Yeah, and I can confirm it has very little day-to-day -day impact on, on what we do. It's, it's a different standard, different burden that's, that's easy to, to apply. Um, and, and we actually have statistics. We publish a motion to amend study. I mean, and the vast, vast majority, about 90% of the denials are for your just basic routine. Um, regardless of who has the burden, this fails under 102 or 103. Um, so it doesn't really matter who has the burden. The outcome is the, the amendment wasn't enough to get away from the art. So I, I think it's worth stepping back for a little bit and considering that I think Sapna is right that there's been a fractured approach to the Federal Circuit. And in fact, I would say it extends even to the Supreme Court. But it's best understood as an historical arc. The first cases in the Federal Circuit that it tested the limits of um, of PTAB power in this then new system, and we're still getting our feet under us. Um, I think both the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court were interested in giving the PTAB a wide, uh, wide berth and letting them come to some internal equilibrium themselves, and then evaluating, rather than stepping in right away and saying, oh, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. So we see um, on the question of uh, what is now, you know, the partial institution uh, reversal in SAS, uh, synopsis versus mentor graphics, precedential panel decision, which then, you know, is followed until um, it's uh, it's over over por uh, powered by the by the higher authority of the Supreme Court. In uh, in the case of the one year time bar, a case reference publishing lays down a very uh, uh, I think incorrect and ultimately corrected uh, view of what the one-year time bar stands for, and it was only this year, this January, in Wi-Fi versus Broadcom, that the en banc federal circuit came back and reversed itself in a, in a way similar to Aqua Products. The Supreme Court itself, in Quozo, said that the decision whether to institute uh, review is unreviewable, and they left a few safety valves like statutory authority, constitutional problems, right, shenanigans, and. Uh, can't count the number of times I heard the word shenanigans after that case came down. Um, but then, uh, after upholding the constitutionality of the whole thing in oil states, they came back and said, okay, here's where Quozo doesn't extend to. The final written decision, the adjudicatory obligation, is sufficiently different in kind, so that's a way of putting the brakes on a very broad view of agency power that the Patent Office had adopted for itself. So the early cases were very lenient. Now we're starting to see some retrenchment. And I think that's entirely consistent with both the Federal Circuit and the Supreme Court um, wanting only to step in once there was really a substantial body of case law and a, a well-established practice that they could uh, meaningfully evaluate. So you mentioned uh, Wi-Fi One, and then we also had the follow-on case, uh, Click to Call which got into more detail on when the one-year bar actually kicks in. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you view the impact of that, and given that uh, it's altering the time period in which petitioners can move forward after they're sued? Yeah, so uh, I think it's uh, best understood in conjunction with, with SAS Institute, right? So what I mean by that is um, when you file an inter partes review petition, the likelihood is, the sort of predominant likelihood is, you're doing it defensively after already getting sued for infringement in the district court. So 70% of petitioners, I mentioned this morning, uh, go to the PTAB in this defensive posture. The remaining 30% are striking first, 
because there's no standing requirement, it's cheaper, faster, et cetera. So for them, the one-year time bar has no impact at all because there's no triggering district court complaint. But for those 70% uh, who have been sued, they have to get in under the one-year time bar. When the, the court, the, the en banc federal circuit in Wi-Fi said that we're not saying this is always going to be right or always going to be wrong, just that we have a chance to review it, I think that is sort of systemically enough for the PTAB to get occasional feedback when the, when the need arises. It's obviously not going to come up unless and until there's a final written decision. And the likelihood is PTAB is going to get it right far more often than it's going to get it wrong on the application of the one-year time bar. But after SAS, and this is the empiricist's trick of always having a couple of slides in his pocket, um, this is a distribution of uh, the lag between the first district court case to be filed on a patent and the first IPR petition to be filed on the same patent. Not necessarily the same party, which is why you see stuff well past the one year mark, but that uh, it's basically a bell curve with that massive spike right at one year. Right? Patent lawyers, just like my, my first year students, work to deadlines and they, they wait until the very last minute. So what this tells us is everybody's filing at the one year mark. They're waiting as long as they can to keep as much option value open as they can. You look at the same thing from not the first patent infringement case uh, to the first IPR petition, but the last patent case prior to IPR and the first IPR. That distribution looks roughly the same. It's a little more compressed, but it's still a bell curve, and it still has that really big spike at one year. What this means is if you take Justice Ginsburg's dissent seriously as the patent office and say that we're going to deny this whole thing, because we don't think there's enough here to accept the whole thing, we're going to deny it all, and we'll give you a pretty good roadmap explaining here are the good things, here are the bad things, here are the valid challenges, here are the sort of less likely to succeed challenges, then when the the institution decision uh, is, is handed down, the one-year time bar is already run, right? Because it's three months from petition that you get the patent owner response, and three months from that that you get the institution decision. So what I suspect will, will happen after Wi-Fi 1 is people will start, at least if they want to keep their options open um, with respect to a denial of institution, start filing much, much earlier. And maybe the spike will sort of be uh, absorbed back into the distribution and pushed to the six month or even three months from district court filing mark. Because then, after the six months have passed and you've gotten an institution decision, if it goes the other way, you've still got time to refile, right? And right now, nobody's doing that because they never had to before. Partial institution made this unnecessary. So I think this is uh, a way in which Wi-Fi 1 and SAS Institute are going to interact. Uh, to limit the ability of, of petitioners to make their challenges more strategically. Uh, on this idea of refiling, Judge Sandin, perhaps you could speak a little bit to general plastic and how that might impact this idea. Mm. Right. So that was a decision that uh, we issued, uh, or we made precedential about a year ago. Um, and, and what that does is, is look at this notion of multiple petitions filed over time. Um, and, and provide some factors for the judges to decide, you know, should we, should we look at this, maybe not looking at the merits, but just on the, the fairness aspect, um, you know, are, are there petitioners coordinating to, to learn from each other um, and uh, take that into account and potentially denying uh, a petition just for the fact that, that that's what happened rather than on the merits. Um, and actually, if I can ask a question, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering from the practitioners, uh, the, the effect to the click-to-call decision, which says uh, it, we had previously interpreted Federal Circuit case law to say, um, you know, the served with complaint is undone by a voluntary dismissal. Mm -hmm. um, with that now taken away, are we, and, and that fact pattern comes up a lot, where we see voluntary dismissal, a suit filed again, and then you get the petition. Are we now going to see a voluntary dismissal <coughs> and then a petition, i.e. more petitions earlier than what we had before? You're looking at me. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the practitioner You're the sitting practitioner, up here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think um, what's interesting from, t to me anyway, and, and maybe this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but um, you know, there are you, 
suits filed and voluntarily dismissed often, and then sometimes it just ends it, and then there's a lot of reasons why that may occur. Um, it's not that it gets refiled right away again, such that the, the petition comes. It could be a long time. Um, so I think there is some impact as to, you know, what does that you are served with a litigation actually mean going forward. Um, I do agree it, it, that the data um, with the one year mark with the filing probably will move much earlier in that time frame, um, especially as I think we work through how the PTAB and how the judges will handle um, these types of petitions that will start to test what SAS is actually going to bring about in practice. Um, so I do think it's going to move, but I think um, looking at it from that perspective of does this push PTAB um, and, that, and, the, and that forum to more of this alternative? If, if you are, um, you know, bringing suit or you're sued and it goes away, what are you going to have to do? Are you going to have to bring your one-time petition now, um, you know, because that one-year bar is going to start? Um, you know, depending on where the parties are, it could be years as they continue to go back and forth with, with different sort of cases. So I do think if there is this push, um, you could see practitioners um, and companies wanting to file their petitions a lot earlier because they might lose the PTAB chance if they don't. And it's worth pointing out too, right? The, the, the only people, unlike CBM, where you have to be sued or at least at imminent risk of suit in order to file in the PTAB, inter partes review allows preemptive strikes. And a lot of that 30% who are preemptive strikers, it's not like they're just constantly browsing the interwebs looking for patents to invalidate. They're in the industry, they see their rivals getting sued, and to the extent that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, they see their own self-interest because the patent owner has tipped its hand a little and said, I'm willing to enforce this patent. And even if the voluntary dismissal comes, not just the person who was originally targeted for the infringement, but third parties who are observing uh, what's going on also have uh, information and incentive to file these, these challenges now. So in the short run, I suspect, uh, in answer to your question, Judge, we probably will see at least some more petitions, um, and they will be from people who've not yet been sued. Uh, because they have better information. And they also know that the, the patent owner, by voluntarily dismissing, may have signaled uh, some sort of hesitation about the strength of their case. If the mere filing of, a, of an IPR petition scares them off and gets them to voluntarily dismiss, that's useful information too. So it's a lot of reading the tea leaves, but there, there's certainly scope for it. Carrie, did you have Yeah, just to add one other thing. So I mentioned that, you know, we'll do clearance opinions and we'll flag, you know, potential uh, patents that, that we could be you know, accused of infringing and, and do all the homework um, so that we're in a position to file an IPR sooner. Uh, so, I mean, and there's some recent instances where uh, people have waited till a 12-month period and the, uh, the PTAB dismisses the uh, petition. Uh, so. You know, we, we don't want to be in that situation, so we, uh, you know, have the homework done so we can move uh, more quickly, not take the whole 12 months. And I think we have maybe about two minutes left, so I just want to throw one question out to whoever wants to answer it. You know, a lot of these changes that we saw over the past year were from the PTAB or from the courts. Is that the right place? Should changes be coming from somewhere else in the future? Uh, what are changes that are on the horizon that we should be paying attention to? Whoever wants to answer, whichever question they want to answer. I mean, is, is the thrust of your question all the legislation that's being floated? Because I can imagine, right, there's the Hatch-Waxman Integrity Act, there's the Stronger Patents Act, there are all these pieces of legislation that do everything from legislatively abolish the PTAB to um, make it harder to uh, IPR an orange book patent uh, either choose to go there or choose to go into ANDA, but you can't do both um, through, through the, the Hatch-Waxman system. So there are certainly lots of legislative proposals, and I'm not you know, particularly well-connected politically, so I don't know what chance they have of passing, but I think the Stronger Patents Act is a good example of a situation in which the broadest reasonable interpretation was 
uh, uh, legislatively overruled to use Phillips. That was the one of the provisions in that act. And then, rather than let it get that far, because if it if it gets you know if it goes forward, it's going to end up doing a lot more harm than good. The agency quite sensibly uh, made that change uh, by rulemaking and is now uh, considering its uh, com the comments it got in response to its proposal. So. To the extent that there's an ongoing dialogue between the PTAB and the courts, the PTAB and the Congress, uh, every time we hear something new come out from one of those external uh, sources, if the PTAB uh, sort of is, is increasingly self-reflective and has a lot of data that it can use to make these judgments and says, look, we have the authority to do this within ourselves, let's just do it ourselves so that we're not put upon in ways that we won't be able to control later on. I think that's a good way for the agency to pursue, it's, uh, to proceed. It's cautious, it's incremental, and it doesn't uh, rock the wagon too much. I don't think the courts are capable of figuring out the PTAB's powers. I think that the federal circuit is hopelessly confused over even just the basics mm. of what kind of authority the PTO has and how to review their decisions. And if you believe the, the morning panels, the Supreme Court is trying to get the administrative state and using patents as, you know, treating it as just collateral for that. Um, so ultimately, I think what we need is for Congress to step in and to affirmatively strengthen and reiterate the powers of the PTO. But I don't think we're going to get that in the current political climate. I see we are out of time, so thank you, everyone. So we're going to just take one minute and switch into the next panel. And the session code is E1121. E1121. Okay, our next panel is PTAP strategy in a changing environment, claim construction, amendments, and section 112.6. Uh, our moderator is Catherine Taylor, uh, an associate at Leidig, Leidig Voigt, and Mayer, and she's an uh, alum of this law school. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine. Um, so as we've been talking about today, and particularly as we've heard from the last panel, there has been substantial P, uh, changes uh, to the PTAB. So what this panel is really going to focus on uh, is strategies for petitioners and patent owners on how to you know, handle IPRs in the recent developments. So I will briefly introduce the panel, and then they will each make a brief opening statement. Um, so with us today, we have uh, David Killow from Microsoft, who is Assistant General Counsel in the Litigation, Competition, and Compliance Group. Uh, Joshua Landau, and if I'm mispronouncing your names, I apologize, um, who is Patent Counsel for the Computer and Communications Industry Association. Professor Joshua Sarnoff from DePaul University College of Law. Uh, David Newman, who I skipped over, I apologize, a uh, partner at Golden Ratner. And Jim Sherwood from Google, who is a litigation counsel. So um, maybe let's start with you, David. Uh, sure, just to give you my uh, perspective, uh, I work on uh, pat patent litigations and so I'm uh, up at the PTAB as adjunct to those. Uh, and uh, just to give as much time for questions as possible, uh, I'll just echo what you heard on our earlier panels that uh, SAS for me is uh, one of the biggest new issues. Uh, and click to call has really risen to the fore as well as something that's causing complications for us at Microsoft. Joshua Landau, I'm the Patent Counsel at CCIA, which means that I do policy work. So a lot of what I do is what the policy of IPR should look like, comment to the PTO. I would echo that SAS has been important, but I would also keep an eye on the rulemaking developments that are coming through 
as we speak. Hi, I'm David Newman. I'm at Golden Ratner here in Chicago. I have a, an IP practice that covers all types of IP, including uh, work at the PTAB. Um, I've been focusing a lot on arbitration and think that to some extent it's overlooked in, in this context that parties could use arbitration in place of an IPR. And I think the patent statute section 294 gives the parties a lot of powers to customize a process that could lead to the same result as an IPR. Thank you. Josh Sarnoff, I'm a professor at uh, DePaul University across town. Um, and I think that uh, among the various things uh, that are going on, the cha proposed change to the claim construction standard is either, if you listen to the IPO and their recent report, not really much of a big deal because very few patents turn on uh, the difference between the broadest reasonable interpretation or Phillips, or it's an incredibly big deal if we actually think that the difference in claim construction matters. Um, so I'll just uh, leave it for questions to follow up. I did file based on uh, views of the different claim construction standards that are mostly summarized in an introductory chapter to the annual IP Law Association of Chicago's uh, claim construction uh, case book of the Federal Circuit um, comments in the Patent Office urging them not to go forward with the proposed change. Jim Sherwood, I'm uh, Patent Litigation Counsel at Google. I'm, I'm based in our uh, Washington, D.C. office, and I've been with Google uh, just over seven years now uh, and have handled uh, numerous district court litigations. I've been involved in uh, many PTAB proceedings, uh, Federal Circuit appeals, and uh, increasingly a number of uh, litigations in foreign jurisdictions as well. Um, our, our practice before the PTAB uh, is the, the majority of it is ex parte appeals in our prosecution matters, but we're, we're obviously no stranger to litigation as well, and so uh, we have a, a number of litigation matters where we've filed IPR uh, petitions. And we, we found, as some of the charts have shown, that it is becoming increasingly challenging uh, as a petitioner to uh, succeed both in terms of the institution rates and success rates in final written decisions. So. Uh, you know, we, we try to stay on top of all of the changes, and uh, it's it's a relatively new proceedings as, as these things go, so there have been a lot of changes, and it's hard for me to point to one that's uh, uh, most important to us, but we, we uh, you know, really try to stay on, on top of all of the developments. Okay. You know, so the last panel we talked about uh, briefly uh, whether or not SAS Institute is going to um, adversely affect either a patent owner or benefit a patent owner or a petitioner. And, you know, regardless of SAS Institute, you know, the updated AIA trial practice guide now permits surreplies to principal briefs as a matter of right, um, including a reply and an opposition to a motion to amend. So it seems as if the patent owner now effectively has the last say in an IPR. You know, this coupled with uh, the Apple Products decision, which was also touched on briefly on the last panel, uh, which shifts the burden of persuasion um, regarding patentability to the petitioner, and also coupled with claim construction, which uh, Professor Sarnoff touched on, and we'll talk a little bit more out later. It seems as if these new guidelines uh, tend to favor a patent owner. So I'm going to address this first question to Jim, and then maybe the rest of the panel can chime in, because I read that Google was the sequ second most IPR filer in 2018. Um, so, A, how have petitioners really adjusted their strategy in light of all these changes? And B, is it even worth it to file an IPR right now? Sure. Uh, so, just in, in terms of the number of IPR petitions we, we file, I, ideally, we wouldn't file any. Um, unfortunately, we don't really have a say in how many plaintiffs sue us. So, our, our position with respect to IPR proceedings is, is often uh, reactive. So. Uh, the way we approach IPR proceedings is really, it's, it's, I'm going to give a very boring answer just to warn everybody. It's, uh, you know, we take every case on a case-by-case -case basis, and when a case comes in, we, we do a thorough prior art search, and if we find prior art that we feel can make a compelling case for an IPR petition, then we'll typically go forward with it. Um, 
In terms of some of the discussion, I, I thought I'd touch on some of the discussion from the last panel about uh, timing, both with, with respect to the Wi-Fi 1 uh, decision and the SAS decision, because my, my reaction to uh, some of the recent developments is that uh, my inclination, if we're going to go forward with an IPR proceeding and prepare a petition, uh, the petition has to, that's our case in chief. We have to put all of our evidence, all of our arguments in that petition and make as compelling a case a, as we can. Otherwise, it, it doesn't make sense to go forward with it. Uh, and, and for me, that weighs in favor of taking the time to make sure that you've looked for the best prior art, that you've developed your arguments fully, and you've put together a, a very strong petition. Uh, so some of the discussion uh, around filing earlier in order to put yourself in a position where you might get an institution decision and you could file a second round um, I think that's actually really challenging to do. So um, I, I would say that, you know, there may be some shift overall towards earlier filings, but, but I would say, just given the challenges that petitioners have, that that may ne not necessarily be the best strategy. And in order to really be able to do that, uh, to, to file a petition on time to get an institution decision and still have time to file another petition, you really have to be in a position to file your first petition uh, within three months of being served with the complaint, with, within three to four months. Uh, otherwise, you're really going to be cutting it close in terms of, of the deadlines. And, you know, if you approach these proceedings um, uh, looking at the parallel litigation that uh, relates to the, the patent that you're going to challenge, figuring out what claims to challenge within three, mo three months of service is nearly impossible. In most cases, you won't have any identification of asserted claims. You'll have no insight into claim construction positions that are going to be taken. And I don't think it's a good idea for petitioners, and I don't think it's a good idea in terms of the, the board's uh, workload for petitioners to proactively challenge every uh, claim of a patent. We, we often see patents that might have 50 to 60 to 80 claims, and I don't think it's in anyone's interest to uh, prepare petitions that challenge all of those claims. So I think a, a far better approach, both uh, in terms of the party's resources and the board's resources, is to wait until you get some narrowing in terms of the asserted claims uh, so that you can file a more focused petition and, um, and have, a, have a better chance of success by really focusing on the claims that are potentially going to be in dispute. Uh, so in that respect, that's sort of my long-winded way of saying I'm not sure the overall strategy changes, but, but the timing, in my view, it, it may actually be the case that petitioners look to make sure they've done everything they can before uh, filing a petition. And, and so it, it may not be that we see uh, petitions filed much earlier. Anybody else comments on that? Chime in. So I'll, I'll, I'll just add very quickly that um, Assuming after SAS the petitions get denied and then you have repetitive petitions, um, the General Plastics case raises some really interesting questions of administrative law. General or generally, the basic premise is this is committed to the unreviewable discretion to deny sequential petitions, but you have precedential board rulings and under at least some case law, um, rules adopted by an agency, certainly, but even guidance may be binding against the agency employees. There's a case called Service v. Dulles from a long time ago. And similarly, there's supposed to be an adequate explanation for changes and departures from precedent under the FCC versus Fox TV case. So it's going to lead to some very interesting administrative law uh, issues, since that's what this conference seems to be about, uh, of when the serial petitions get denied and people say, yeah, but you're not following your own guidelines. Precedents. Yeah, I'd, uh, I would uh, pick up on, on both those uh, comments and, and first echo Jim's that uh, certainly at Microsoft we had the same bar for uh, filing uh, IPRs even before SAS, and that's the merits of the IPR determined on a claim by claim basis, each claim we were going to challenge. And, uh, you know, we wouldn't file an IPR unless we felt that it was uh, really uh, going to be. Uh, you know, top notch and have a very strong chance of uh, taking the day on every claim that we challenged. And, and uh, if anything, I think SAS certainly 
reemphasizes that, and you have to double down. I hope everybody's doing that because uh, I think principally because of the workload issue is that the, the petitioners collectively don't want to overload the patent office and have that, you know, backfire. And so it's incumbent on each petitioner to uh, not throw the spaghetti bowl against the wall, but to be really rigorous about determining the merits on a claim by claim basis. Uh, as far as who's advantaged or not by uh, by the change from SAS, um, I'm still of the opinion I was, you know, before the cert petition was was taken, is that uh, uh, I didn't know anybody other than Tim Wilson at SAS that was happy about the whole thing. That it wasn't good for the petitioners, it wasn't good for the patent owners, it's not good for the patent office, uh, and I'm I'm convinced that that's still the case. I heard, you know, and uh, the academics seem to come up with some reasons why it's going to be good, but I'm not sure that I. It. Uh, it certainly created 112 problems. It's really messed up the tactics on how to uh, deal with uh, indefinite claims uh, because uh, before you could use the tactic of including a claim you thought was indefinite in your petition for the very purpose of having institution denied on the basis that it was indefinite. And of course, you know, now that's no longer an option and there are really complicated bar problems estoppel problems if uh, you inadvertently include one that's, you know, that concludes indefinite and that's carried through to the end and the final written decision, you know, uh, comes up saying we're not declaring it unpatentable, uh, that's a problem, uh, you know, because you don't want to lose your prior defenses on that even though you have a little leg up on 112, that's not sufficient. Not every judge in the world is going to buy that, not every judge in the world is going to decide it versus maybe he'll send it to even a jury. Uh, and then the general plastics gets layered in on top of those things because general plastics says that, uh, you know, you, the, the issue of serial petitions and not just from a single petitioner, but just, you know, the parties get sued as these, ca these cases do. The NPEs, they sue one after another, after another, after another, and it's not my fault that I'm number 10 versus number one. Uh, and I, I would like to file, you know, a petition uh, and maybe I've got better art or a better take on the, the other art, and, and I think I ought to be able to take a run at that uh, and, and not be cut off. But now, with the SAS issues and the general plastic issues and the fact that each attorney believes that his petition is better than somebody else's petition, there really becomes a race dynamic among that. It complicates joint defense groups because uh, the parties are a little bit more hesitant to share prior art, so there's all these practical implications. So. I, I think all these things are sort of balling together to, uh, you know, make uh, my, make life uh, more complicated uh, for patent litigators, which uh, of course is a very good thing for me in terms of employment, but pretty tough on the clients. So I think this is actually a perfect segue into the next topic. You know, if it, if it makes it more complicated for patent litigators, and you know, you can talk about this a little bit. What are the alternatives then to filing an IPR? And, and how should uh, challengers really decide what forum to use? I know, David Newman, you wrote a book about this, really. Yeah, yeah, so um, I echoed, I'll just echo what I said before about arbitration. Um, Section 294 allows the, the parties to bring an arbitration that uh, mirrors an IPR, and you can have a, a ruling that is recognized by the Patent Office. So. Um, there's lots of advantages to arbitration that, that deal with the complications and the expense. Uh, the parties can fashion a process that is streamlined and takes out cost. Um, it, it has all the other benefits of arbitration. It's, it's private, it's confidential. Um, it can be speedier and the, the process, as I said, can be customized so that you can uh, you know, focus your discovery or focus the, uh, the amendment process, um, and all of this uh, can be done to uh, have a, a ruling on the validity as well as bring in global issues. So it's possible to have a hybrid ADR process where you start out with an arbitration and you may turn it into a mediation later on to help bring in uh, some of the issues that the parties are involved in at the district court, if, if there's a district court action that led to the, 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 the potential for an IPR. So I think that uh, in terms of which forum, I don't know that these decisions are going to be that meaningful other than maybe general plastics where you are the 10th defendant. You may be changing your decision about whether an IPR is going to get filed so much as whether there's going to be a forum in which this happens at all 
or whether the risk is too high and you have to settle it. I think that these decisions have generally swung things back a bit towards the patent owner, and that changes settlement math, but not necessarily the forum selection issue. Any additional comments? So I want to also now circle back and talk a little bit. I, I mentioned it in my first question about the claim construction issue, um, because we actually have two people on the panel that submitted comments, uh, Josh Lando for uh, CCIA, as well as Professor Josh Sharnoff. And uh, so people were invited to submit comments in response to the proposed standards. I believe there were over 300 comments submitted. And I, from a cursor review, it seemed that the majority of those were actually in favor of uh, the switch from the um, uh, broadest reasonable interpretation standard to the Phillips standard. So I was wondering, maybe we can start with both of you, uh, Josh and Professor Sarnoff, and you could talk a little bit about your comments and then you know how that's going to affect strategy going forward. So we put in some fairly detailed comments. I'll try and give the, the very quick summary of why we thought this was a bad choice to make. One is that the Patent Office claims that this is going to improve consistency. The evidence is that it won't. There simply aren't very many cases where there is any inconsistency. It isn't an issue that arises very often. There isn't this conflict. Another is that I'm not 100% sure that the statute actually provides them with this ability. I think that the way the statute was written, it is very suggestive. The legislative history is certainly suggestive that Congress intended the broadest reasonable interpretation, and I'm not sure the director has the power to change that. Um, in terms of the impact, I, I think, as I think you said during the opening, uh, if you ask some people, it won't have any impact, at which point I ask, so why do we need to make this change in the first place? or it may have a significant impact. I think it's somewhere in the middle. There are definitely cases where there will be an impact. There are other cases where there isn't enough daylight that it matters or the prior art is inside of the Phillips construction as well as the broadest reasonable interpretation. I think the real risk comes in, especially in the amendments prospect. As written, it would be amended and examined under Phillips, which wouldn't happen anywhere else in the office. The whole point of the broadest reasonable interpretation is that these are new claims we need to look at in the broadest light to make sure that nothing issues that shouldn't have. So I think that's the one of the dangers in the proposal. So I want to go back to something that the PTAD judge had mentioned, which was that they're after aqua products, they're not really seeing much of a difference from the amended, uh, amended claims. 90%, I think, was the number that was used are still going down, even though the burden shifted. But as Josh just pointed out, um, that's under the Phillips, I'm sorry, that's under the BRI standard. Under Phillips, if we really think that there is a difference between how broad the claim is, and as Josh also notes, these are claims for amendments that have never been examined before, unlike the stuff that has been examined, whether it's expired and subject to Phillips or it is an expired subject to BRI, that could make a massive difference in terms of how the amended claims get evaluated. Um, but I also just want to say that I actually think it makes a much bigger difference than people think. It's just that we don't find the evidence for it because judges can't be honest about what they're doing. And the reason I say that is remember that the basic premise of Phillips is that we have this basic conflict between reading the claims broadly and less the terms might be suggest to a person skilled in the art, or more narrowly in light of the embodiments in the specification. There's no rule for doing that. And you get lots and lots of split decisions from appellate courts saying it was one way or the other, which the methodology should preclude. So there's actually, I think, a very high level of differential that if you applied BRI to those decisions, it would all come out a different way where the court has, in its majority, as opposed to its dissent, said, we're interpreting the claims narrowly in light of the specification. There are other aspects to the doctrine as well that tend to force narrowing constructions. And particularly, I think that the basic premise is, is that judges, and even PTAB judges to some extent, once the claims have issued, may be inclined to try to preserve validity, notwithstanding that it's a disfavored um, doctrine. So the basic premise that I started with is, is that although we really do want uniformity, it is a much better system. The Patent Office actually didn't go to um, the BRI 
only to because it you know, wanted to assure that the claims were narrowed later. It's that when the court started construing narrowly by importing unstated li um, limitations, they said, we won't do that to prevent that problem. That's exactly why BRI does make a difference from Phillips. It's exactly why the entire system should be based on BRI. Then you're not trying to weigh the subjective judgments about judges, either about fairness to the applicants or to the patent holder versus the public. Similarly, you're not trying to weigh the, a subjective intention of what the applicant drafted. It's the objective meaning of the words that they used. So really, this just goes back to our earlier panels. Are we textualists or intentionalists when we read our patent claims? And I would argue that BRI is a te textualist matter that would make much better sense rather than trying to figure out when and how to interpret more narrowly in light of the examples based on what we think the applicant intended to use those words to mean until we actually get better guidance about that, which I think is going to be very difficult. All of that's in the comments. I encourage you to read them. Um, but I do think that what it suggests is, even though we don't see the actual cases which say, well, we used BRI, but now we're using Phillips and it comes out differently, I think it happens all the time. I think it matters dramatically. And most importantly, as I also suggest, if we can get rid of Phillips in the courts, everyone will know what the patents mean, particularly when they have plural meanings. Right? It means the sum of all of those meanings unless one of them is unreasonable. At that point, we minimize litigation. The whole system will run better. Do you think this is going to have any effect, though, on means plus functions claims? Because uh, arguably the Phillips standard is better for means plus function claims compared to the broadest reasonable interpretation. I don't see why, because we still have to construe the claims you know, in light of the embodiments, because you have a special rule of construction for means plus function claims. So I don't see that there should be much of a difference there, precisely because the language says, so again, the problem is that assume for a minute that you have a bunch of embodiments, you have some statutory, some claim language, and you're trying to construe in light of those embodiments what's an equivalent. That's a difficult question, but there's nothing in the language of the statutory requirement or in the Phillips approach, except that Phillips suggests there's only one right answer by saying there's a best construction rather than the broadest or multiple meanings that you could attribute. And if it's multiple meanings, then it's going to be the broadest reasonable multiple meanings of what's equivalent to what was in the spec. Except I would just add that some Phillips interpretations given by the judges are unreasonable. So if it's not reasonable, then it shouldn't be included. But <laughs> right. And, and my, I might add, many Phillips constructions asserted by lawyers are even more unreasonable. And thankfully, many judges get rid of those before they then adopt still one of the unreasonable that are left. <laughs> if I can build on that, yeah. just um, in terms of the cases that, that I see in, in the tech sector, I, uh, um, it, I think the broadest reasonable interpretation standard has a, a practical effect that, that does go unseen, and, and that's that, you know, it's been my experience in a lot of cases that, uh, you know, we're dealing with a handful of asserted patents, we get uh, infringement contentions, which is our, you know, first real indication of what the plaintiff's implied construction is, what the patent owner really thinks the scope of their claims is. And often those infringement contentions are really broad, um, or they imply very broad constructions, uh, broader uh, constructions than, than I would have thought the broadest reasonable interpretation is, and that's their Phillips construction. Uh, and, and so when we see those situations, that's a red flag for us that uh, IPR, you know, looking for prior art that falls within their construction, that's, that's a strategy that we should really strongly consider. And, and as Josh said, there is a range under Phillips. Nautilus acknowledges that. Teva sort of implicitly acknowledges that the Phillips standard um, incorporates a range of potential constructions, and we do see district judges coming to different conclusions about claim scope. 
And, and I think without the broadest reasonable interpretation when we're in this situation where we're faced with a very broad implied construction, the, the risk is uh, that you know, we potentially end up in a situation where within that range of permissible Phillips constructions, if, if the PTAB is applying the Phillips standard, there's a risk that we end up with a uh, uh, narrower construction in uh, the PTAB and then go to trial under a plain and ordinary meaning or where a jury is tasked with ultimately uh, applying you know, a construction to the prior art and to the uh, accused products. There's a, there's a real possibility that could kind of be a little bit behind the scenes, but there's a real possibility that we are dealing with narrower constructions in the PTAB. And that's, I think that's potentially problematic. I just want to add to that the point that I think is very well made by you that what narrowing those kinds of constructions does also shrinks the scope of the prior art that you look at for purposes of determining in an IPR whether you've got a 102 or a 103 rejection. And again, not doing that at the outset, but using all reasonable meanings is the way we should do it just across the board and get uniformity that way. Of course, the PTO can't force that on the courts. What they can do is lobby Congress to make that happen. Yeah, I, I'm of the school that I'm not sure that there are going to be very many uh, cases where it actually makes a difference in the patent office. Uh, I think, you know, I can envision that the parties will now be talking about things differently. You know, currently, typically I go into an IPR uh, and we have our prior art and we like to, you know, pitch the position that that prior art invalidates under the broadest reasonable construction, which includes the plaintiff's incorrect construction. But it's also, you know, even if you apply our, you know, Microsoft's, which is going to be the correct construction, even in district court, you apply that, they still lose under the same prior art. Uh, and I think we'll continue to assert that position. We'll just no longer be saying one's the broadest reasonable construction. We'll be saying that's what the plaintiff is telling you is the Phillips construction. We think they're wrong, but even if it is, they still lose. You know, here's the correct construction, and they lose under that. So I think most of the time, you know, it's not going to make any practical difference from us from that perspective. What I'm most hoping is that the patent office isn't going to make the mistake of creating an SAS problem for itself, the main problem being the retroactivity and having to all of a sudden go into figuring out how are we going to redo everything that's still in process. Uh, and so here's an option where, you know, they saw, the patent office saw what SAS did to them in terms of upsetting the cart for things in progress, and here they have an opportunity if they're going to go this way and make this change uh, to just do it prospectively so they won't do an SAS to themselves. Yeah, I think that if they do that, apply it retroactively, and this was also in our comments, they create real process issues for themselves because that IPR petition was filed with our alternative assumptions based on BRI that might not have been the same if they knew that Phillips was how it was going to be adjudicated down the road. If I could just add, right now, we're in a limbo period where if you're preparing a petition, you may have to consider that uh, Phillips is going to come in, or you may have to consider, you know, maybe it's going to get turned down and, and we're, you're stuck with BRI. But I think in preparing the petition, it's going to be much more expensive because you have to consider both routes and it's just creating a lot of complexity and cost to the system. On the retroactivity point, I think it's going to be difficult for the PTO if they do adopt the rule not to apply it to currently pending cases. But the interesting question will be if they made decisions under the BRI standard and then they've changed the rule, presumably the Court of Appeals on review has got to review it on the BRI standard, which is going to be very awkward for them. <laughs> So um, I guess we can turn a little bit also back to SAS Institute. We talked more so about it uh, for strategy when it comes to petitioners, but uh, how do you think it is going to affect the strategy for patent owners, particularly um, with respect to preliminary responses? Do you think it's worth it now to file a preliminary response? I'll start with you, Amy. Uh, well, luckily I haven't had to be in that position uh, as yet, but uh, you know, I, don't, uh, I don't know that it's going to really uh, change anything from the patent owner's perspective. Uh, I think the patent owner's response was was and will continue to be best used for something that, you know, viewed as, as a, gonna, something that can knock out at that stage, you know, some obvious uh, gap in the prior art, some claim construction issue where you believe that the petitioner just, you know, just has it dead wrong. Uh, you know, if there's some, 
you know, perhaps, perhaps there's some, you know, fundamental standing type problem or uh, just, you know, where, where one of the boxes didn't get, you know, checked for actually being entitled to file a petition. I think those have been the best courses and I think they'll continue to be, at least that's my impression from really not having to come at it from that perspective. Likewise, I don't generally come at it from the perspective of the patent owner, but I think that the same uses are going to be there, even if you don't get the you know, those claims taken out of your petition. Having the office, even if they continue to institute with a number of claims that are effectively denied, having your threshold decision on institution say these claims are probably valid, that's valuable to a patent owner. Yeah, I agree. Uh, SAS Institute won't change a lot with the preliminary a patent owner statement. I think to, when you file that statement, you have to have very strong grounds, like you can antedate the reference or uh, something technical, but I don't think SAS changes that. And this was a question on, you know, some of the list of questions we received, but, and, and I think we've already touched on this, but I guess I'll bring it up again. You know, we said earlier that 90% of amended claims are still going down. I believe someone already said that uh, during the course of an IPR. So do you think um, it's worth it to pursue amended claims during an IPR? Do you think Aqua Products doesn't have any type of benefit for that? Do a motion to amend? So I think I will just, uh, I forget exactly which justice it was, but I would just suggest that they were probably right that the claims aren't being allowed in amendment because they're just not good claims that are being proposed. So if patent owners propose better claims, then that rate will go up, but that hasn't been the case so far. I'll just add something that you had mentioned earlier, which is a lot of it may really depend on whether there's adequate written description for the narrower limitation you want to put in there. And um, again, trying to do meaningful evaluation on lots of amended claims for written description is going to really increase the burden and workload of the PTAB judges. Um, so I worry that this is going to, again, force more non-institution decisions that then are going to run up against the timing problem that Saurabh had noted. <laughs> yeah, my, my experience with uh, amendments in IPRs is, is pretty limited. What, I, what I've seen is, uh, and I can only think of a handful of matters, is that the proposed claims were, the differences were trivial, and, and the result was that the, the amended claims weren't uh, allowed. Um, the, the other aspect I've, uh, of this that I've seen, and I think uh, the, the reason that in a lot of these cases we're not seeing motions to amend is, is that in the majority of IPR pr proceedings we're dealing with patents that are be as being asserted in litigation and patent owners don't want to amend their claims because that's going to affect uh, potential damages in parallel litigation. Uh, what I have seen, and I think this is another reason that we don't see a lot of amendments in IPR proceedings, uh, I, in, in one of the early IPR proceedings I, I handled, I uh, remember wondering why we weren't seeing a motion to amend. I, I actually thought it, it might be one where, uh, based on some discussions I had had with the other side, I thought we would, uh, we would see a motion to amend. It, it turned out they were filing amended claims, but they were filing them in, in continuation applications, and I didn't realize that until they told me that they didn't care about the IPR proceeding because they were continuing to prosecute claims around our product anyway. So that was kind of a pleasant surprise. And, and again, if they have the written description support, then, you know, the change in the claim construction standard might allow them to get to the same place without a formal amendment, just saying, no, no, these are the examples we gave, that's how you should have been reading the claim to begin with. We have about 10 minutes left, and so I was thinking we could open it up for questions if anybody has any questions for our panel. So I want to pick up on this amendment issue, because I find it very interesting that uh, uh, no one expects to see amendments because you don't think they're amendable. Because it's uh, in ex parte re-exams, it's something like two-thirds of claims uh, came out amended. And I'm trying to understand what the different mechanism would be. A lot of those, most of those, I think, most of those re-exams were with parallel litigation, so you'd have the same issues there. Uh, 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 I mean, they were the same, same pool of patents, types of patents that you would expect uh, would be in IPRs now, prior to the American Events Act, would have been in re-exam. So 
I'm trying to figure out why there's this now this mechanism where claims aren't amendable and we don't expect to see a lot of amendments, whereas two thirds of patents were amended in re-exam and is it just literally the adversarialness having the uh, other, other party there now in IPRs? Yeah. I would say you answered your own question with the last, is the adversarial nature is the difference and also uh, you know, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but my impression is that in ex parte re-exams, uh, also a lot more of those are ended up with existing claims being reaffirmed, you know, not, and, and a lot of those amendments are just, that's the patent owner is just piling on because you've just given them an opportunity, you know, uh, particularly if it's litigation related, they're already, you know, doing the homework, looking into the product, and they can, you know, and if you, you know, you've throw, thrown out an ex parte re-exam, which is a real Hail Mary from my perspective, uh, then, uh, you know, they might as well, if they can do an amendment which further bolsters validity and still reads on your product, they just have a free pass to do it and they were just given it. And they're not going to be losing the other claims. Uh, I think the difference is uh, in uh, the proceedings we're seeing now under the AIA is, you know, they're not getting the amendment, but they're not getting the other claims either. And I, so I think it's a totally different world. I'll just add that we may actually see the statistics go down from 90% over time as people now realize they can more freely amend if there's going to be written description support again for these claims. The other thing is, is again, this goes back to the adversarial nature. I mean, it's, it's an interesting question culturally whether the PTAB judges view their job differently from the reexamination units as, you know, our goal is to try to get you the patent versus we're just neutral judges giving you the right answer, right? I don't have any basis for this, but if you're doing an ex parte re-exam, I think you have your patent prosecutor doing that and not your litigator. So mm -hmm. I think the personalities involved makes a difference. Yeah. So one thing that I've heard sort of underlying uh, all of the comments in this, in this very thoughtful panel is the, the view of the PTAB as a source of substantial error correction on uh, mistakes that may have made it through examination, right? particularly uh, false positives. So I wonder what your impression is about the following distinction, which I haven't heard made a lot, uh, either in the courts or in the, in the scholarship on this. And that is, on the one hand, you have differences between the PTAB and district courts on things like standing, cost, expertise, all of which are intended to make the PTAB a systemically more desirable forum than the district court. On the other hand, you have a separate set of differences, such as the ability in the statute to, I mean, the statute, as Quozo sort of revealed to us, uh, doesn't say one way or the other what the, the claim construction standard should be, and at the very least, the patent office is within its rights to use BRI if it wants, okay? So that is, uh, is one thing that we've had until now, and the other is there's no presumption of validity and all you need is a preponderance rather than clear and convincing evidence. That seems to me different in kind because patents that could have survived in district court are now going to fall in uh, litigation, not because the party that is challenging them has one stake or another. That doesn't seem to me sort of particularly salient to the validity of the patent, okay? And same thing with expertise. Presumably greater expertise, less cost, basically controls who gets in the door. Once you're in the door, the standard against which the patent is evaluated is now different. If you take away those differences, and this is where the patent office, I think, really got it right, because I, I helped file a set of comments uh, supporting the change uh, to, to Phillips, right? The, if you've got the same, um, claim construction standard, if you had the same uh, preponderance uh, being changed to, to clear and convincing evidence and a presumption of validity, then all else is equal that should be equal and the stuff that's not the same in the PTAB isn't really stuff that bears on the validity, it just goes to who's challenging it. Is that a distinction that you all think holds water? 
Yes, and the right answer is overturn I4I and make the courts use BRI. So you have a consistent standard. That's the correct and better standard. <laughs> Yeah, there is a reasonable difference there. I think that distinction makes sense, but this was the intention of Congress, that this be a easier way to invalidate a patent based on the perception that the courts were not invalidating patents that should have been invalidated. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that the processes count for the degree of difference we see. Uh, I think that's the difference between expertise versus jury. And, uh, you know, honestly, and, and yes, if patent office was applying clear and convincing evidence, would that have some effect and some of these patents would get through that are being validated now? Probably so. I don't know that it would be a huge percentage greater. I think I think the process is, that's not the difference. I do think it's expertise versus truth. Going to that question, could somebody please explain to me why for these questions of law, um, written description is a question of fact, but you know, obviousness and all of the other invalidity grounds, we're giving this to juries in the first place rather than having the judge just ask for advisory verdicts on the facts. It makes no sense. And the courts haven't shut this down. <laughs> Any additional questions? All right, we only have two minutes left, so we'll just end early. So thank you to the panel.